Uh, <laughs> I always do this. Welcome to the risk meeting for March 24th. And we're talking about upstream and downstream dependencies at the moment. Well, yeah, I'm just sort of thinking through the, the merit of that as a metric. Because I think, as Vinod mentioned, it is more about just kind of a popularity metric versus a risk metric, if we're talking about risk to that project. Yeah. yeah I think it's like downstream is, no, upstream. Okay, I see I'm already confused. Downstream is the one we defined, right? Upstream. Upstream, okay. <laughs> so, 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 so with downstream de dependencies, like there's a there's a sort of a, a set of projects that have so many downstream dependencies that their their entire reputation can be damaged by failing to serve the people who use them downstream. I think the Linux kernel has a lot more downstream dependencies than upstream ones. But Interesting. So you're, you're saying it's a it's a reputational risk more than well, I'm, I'm thinking a... that's one of the considerations. The, like like what happened with Node.js. I think I, I know a lot of development teams really don't like to use Node.js at this point because the there's a the way that it weaves together a collection of dependencies downstream for whatever you're building is often changing often has security issues that will break your code and so it leads to a lot of high maintenance and so there there are but there are other projects like i would say that Augur and Grimoire Lab, I don't know that there's any or only a handful of downstream projects that depend on it, right? Those projects are sort of the end of the road. I don't, I'm not aware of anyone importing pieces of Grimoire Lab or Augur to do other things, like as a, like an import into some other tool. So for, I think for a lot of projects, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not sure it matters for Kubernetes, but maybe it does. Well, it's, it matters in a different way. I think sort of the downstream dependencies is, it's more about, I, I feel like, well, I, if I would use it for more contextual awareness, how your thing is being used, understanding your usage, and if you are sort of the core of the project and you have a better understanding of what kinds of things are pulling from your central repositories, then if you're thinking about what things should I be prioritizing in our next version, then taking into account how your project is being used could help inform that decision. I mean, we, we talk about that a lot from the perspective yeah. of understanding the usage of a project, which is also a fairly nebulous task. Um, and so this is a much more explicit task because these are code references that we potentially could track, um, but it, it's, I don't know, because it's not actually usage. <laughs> so uh, I think we'd, we'd have to disambiguate those two kinds of usage, sort of like the explicit product dependency versus an end user who could be depending on it within their own environment, but not in an explicit defined call that we can trace on GitHub. Um, I, can't, thing, I can't spell disambiguate. I, I don't even know if that's a real word. It is. <laughs> um, the other thing that I was thinking about, and I know we, we talked briefly about this last time, was that in the census, they something that I need to better understand in case I hear because you might get it more, um, is that they gave they assigned like a Z value or a Z number. A Z score. Or as, yeah, as a way to provide a relative importance and usage level. So mm -hmm. they are ready to find a way to sort of, it's not downstream dependencies. It's, I think it probably is combining those two, but I'm not really sure. Um, so just if we do want to propose this, I just wanted to flag that as an area where I want to better understand what they did. So if folks are kind of like, what's the difference here? We can cleanly articulate that. Sorry, that was a lot of ideas all at once. I'll stop rambling. Yeah, I, could, can't, I can't capture it all. Uh. I was going to ask you to repeat what's the project that's using the z-score again. Um, yeah, so in the links, 
under the discussion, the Linux Foundation Census 2 of free and open software link. It should be the second one. Um, if you just do a control F and say Z score, is that gonna find it? No, Z dash score. Here we go. Calculate the average Z score. Can I see how this is defined? Sorry, now I'm doing this in real time. It's a fairly complex calculated metric. It's trying to capture the relative importance of a package compared to other package packages. Uh, found it. Thank you. So I think that's coming from citation and usage, but they're not exactly explaining all of it. It says it's equal to the package's value minus the mean of values of the list it comes from. So now I need to know what value means. Values, for, I mean, with z squares, typically it's this wide, it, they use it to compress a wide range, right? So, yeah, well, that's why I'm, this is why I want but to. But that might about. not, that <laughs> might not be the meaning of it in this case. Uh, in this case, I developed for my master's thesis a V index where, like, your project is depending on, like, how many projects are depending on you, which is like first level. And then how many others are depending on that as a second level? Mm -hmm. It's similar to H index of a scholar. Okay, you publish a paper, how many papers are citing you and how many others are citing each of paper for you? Yep, okay. So I mean, one question I have is, since this takes many forms, what's the useful, is there a useful metric that we could develop? In other words, certainly there's things that people measure in this space, but is there, is there a way that we could meaningfully define it in some form or forms of this kind of metric that would be useful? to have defined in a standard way? Or are these really heuristic measures that projects use that are pretty hard to standardize because really the nature of the projects to you know, use context? I mean, every, every project is gonna have the use context problem. I think they're potentially yeah. value and like objective measure. Mm -hmm. In the way that that Z the Z score is being used to provide a comparison across all these different packages and package managers, um, and provide a consistent measurement, even though the user's characteristics could be unique. Um, I think in this case, I just keep coming back to the value of implementing it from the perspective of the project. Um, and in some cases, actually thinking about um, what did I say it was like six months ago where we had a couple of folks from Sustain join one of our dependency meetings or risk meetings rather talking yeah. about what topics they were interested in. And they actually mentioned this offhand as a way for better understanding usage characteristics on projects to identify what they should be investing in or giving money to as sort of a, a fun, a, an investor or distributor of grant money or funding and sponsorships and understanding where there might be prominent large large scale usage around a project that may or may not be maintained or have any means to maintain itself. Um, and so again, that's not really the, I'm, I'm curious if the nature of who actually finds the metric useful, um, like I, it just like, I feel like for that, this kind of metric, it's more useful, not necessarily for the individual maintaining the project. It's more useful as a way to compare projects. That makes sense. So yeah. it, does, do they spell out with any specificity how they get to this mean z-score and how they classify the projects? Not to the level that I've seen yet, which is, I've already asked Kate if we could interview this team. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just because I think that there are many individuals that have thought about this and they clearly took an approach, but 
if they don't share the full details on their approach, then others might repeat what they do. And I can't imagine that's proprietary because it's a research institution. Yeah. They, they didn't explain it well enough, in my opinion, but also maybe I didn't read it closely enough. Well, methods are just, you know, sort of it's almost axiomatic that any any research report explains the methods used to arrive at the indicators insufficiently for someone to repeat them. So is the I is mean the, we can't repeat it at all <laughs> yeah. based on how it's written. So is is the is the fundamental point of the z-score that it puts your it it ultimately gives your package a ranking when compared to some set of other packages that you choose to compare it to. And in the I mean, case of the census, yes. and the census report just looked at the most widely used open source projects. And they had some way of determining that, I believe. At least that's uh, how the first census report came up with its yeah. list. But I think now they're, oh, they, they do they say the top 500 from each, but then it also might be top 500 by Z-score. So Z scored in terms of downstream, right? Like how many others are using that project? I mean, I think that's what they're doing, but they're not explicit about it. They're just saying value, which doesn't mean anything. It looks like they're looking at, uh, this is on page 15 and 16. Uh, explicit usage. Okay. So downstream. I mean, that, that would make sense to me. So you're looking at page 15, 16, limits to dependency network. Okay. And you have to open the report. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have to, I, I guess for it to be useful, I would share it separately from the. So you're saying usage count. Did you see where they're defining usage? Here's 14. Is this, this, is this the section you're looking at, Renisha? Uh, 15, at the end of 15 and 16 is where they start to introduce oh, okay. the Z-score, but I think usage uh might come a little further up yeah it, it just looks at oh, i did see that but it didn't say what kind of usage like is it detailed results of the boss usage no and it's, it's actually pretty it's pretty constrained if they're only using the library's io data set They Listen said they, uh, in the presentation, they said they have uh, got it from the companies. I don't know which company. It seems like they are combining data from multiple sources, so not just libraries I.O. I think that was one of the sources that they use because um, <laughs> I keep reading this in chunks and not more holistically. I think I need to just read the whole thing. Um, but they do talk about the difficulty of combining their various sources. Um, and so I think they are using data from private companies. So potentially use, because it does say public and private usage now that I'm finding about this. So we might not be able to recreate that if they're reporting on usage that companies are reporting. Uh, it's certain, but it's certainly, uh, it certainly seems like a, a way of analyzing a collection. So, uh, I recall, so, oh, go ahead. And, and so the, the scope here is all of open source and, and that's a pretty big scope. So it seems like this is really centered on usage. So if ours is centered on dependency citations, that would be a net different score or a net different number entirely because they're not actually stating anything around dependencies. This is more just, if I'm reading this correctly, it's usage, so. There's an actual well, import statement. I would, that's what that means to me. You think it's something else? They, they trace um, dependencies. Yeah. 
Um, they went for all the projects that were scanned. They also followed all the dependency trees and basically used that as part of the aggregation of the stats. So it is in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, David, Thanks, Kate. <laughs> I, don't, I just you snuck in and came yeah, in. No, and I, I, like, yeah, yeah. I, I finished. I finished my recording and I came and joined. Especially since David, was, David can also talk to this a little bit more. But both he and I have been sitting on the meetings with these people doing the that were doing the research. So we've got a. We, we, we know that the analysis it was it was done actually in some ways the same way some of the dependency tracking was done in the analysis in the first report version of the report. Okay. You know, which is follow it all down <laughs> and then aggregate it and look at it, you know, direct and indirect. Um, but I was from gonna, yep. yeah, yeah, from this conversation, I can see that metric is there, like the usage or in terms of like downstream, how many people are depending on your project. It's clearly a metric which is critical for those which are like critically important projects, maybe not for every project, but at least for those projects for which this report is also there, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Kate, I was just gonna give you the, the two second background of why we're talking about this. We, mm -hmm. um, Vinod had raised the question of whether or not we would like to pursue a downstream dependency metric. Um, and in the meantime, we were trying to dig through this particular report to see how much overlap in mm -hmm. the approach, knowing that this kind of disease score is taking the same kind of thing into account. So versus proposing a new metric, we wanted to see whether or not there was any relationship to this and if we should build on the, the approach in this doc or create a distinct approach, but either way being informed as to how this was arrived at. So one of the things I've found really use, interesting slash useful and want to have my, at my fingertips every day was um, the, what, the, um, off of depths.dev, they have um, the packages impacted. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess yeah. right. And here, just a second, let me give you this link in the chat. And, uh, I think you like gave it to us last time. Did you? Because like I say, I love, mm -hmm. like I say, I think this is, the, so, you know, the summary, uh, how many are actually affected to the effect that you can walk back through the ecosystem and find these things. Yep. Is useful. And, uh, Most people in open source projects don't know how many people are actually using them. That's also the fact there. So is the method for getting this information essentially scanning all of the open source universe or is it some subset? Um, I kind of think it is. Uh, I, I think there actually may be more than is even here because this is only able to scan what they have access to. So it's scanning whatever you have access to. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that's the case because you can see at the all systems drop down at the top right, um, you can see how many things they've imported into it. Um, but it's not inclusive of everything. Like there are other. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so when I was doing libraries.io analysis, they were scanning basically all the package manager, those 33 package mm -hmm. manager they have. And I think it is a similar case. They are scanning all those package managers. And if any package manager is using that particular project is being listed here. If not, then it's not listed here. That's what my assumption is looking at this. Right. But, you know, if as a developer or someone who's working on something, if you know that your software is being used tremendously a wide scope, your yep. behavior may be different. Yes. But if it's just something you're doing for yourself because you think it's amusing or you're yep. just doodling around, but suddenly someone builds a whole bunch of dependencies on top of you. It changes the dynamic and you might be a little bit more responsible in terms of yep. letting people so, setting setting expectations with people, whether you're doing things on a supported level or not, so they can make risk assessments. Yep. You know, if, if something's done for a hobby and then everyone's building this whole big set of dependencies on them, and the person's, you know, the person may want to say, hey, don't do it. Don't build it on this stuff. Go find something else. <laughs> because I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I, like I say, I'm not giving you any commitment while responsible if you find bugs. Yeah. You know, people need to be able to signal that too. You need to signal what you're not doing sometimes. And if people don't, if, if you don't know that there's all a bunch of people suddenly depending on you, you don't know how to, you, there's no reason for you to communicate it. I generally agree with that. 
I think <laughs> the trouble is that we're in order for them to know that they would still have to run the analysis unless someone is just going to notify the project. Did you know that? Right. <laughs> but like I say, I gotta, if, we start, if we start surveying the ecosystem, uh, or you know, people, you know, like Dev saw Dev and others are surveying the ecosystem and making this stuff visible, and these metrics are being captured, then people can go and query them and find them. Like, you know, hey, I know that the community from Zephyr is really excited when they see themselves in the top hundred projects type of deal on some certain lists or things like that. You know, so it's, it's, it's two sides of the same pro issue, right? You know, one of which is preventing the surprises. Oh. People are using me. Oh, shit, I don't want them to do. Versus the, uh, oh, people are using me. This is really cool. Oh, I'm going to do more things. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the, the question is, is a dependent downstream dependency metric useful enough versus something that's closer to the Z-score that's trying to provide more of a comprehensive view of usage? I kind of would like to know things from a, a specific, like, you know, Total package is affected. I who's using me? What's the total number look like? Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, that is, that's useful. Yep, and I agree. <laughs> and, and that's yeah. where I brought this metric as a part of project popularity. I was trying to work on a model project popularity, which can be measured as a downstream, which can be measured as a uh, folks or a star, some other measures, but. One of the metrics I was looking for was this downstream, like how many are dependent and how popular am I or my project yeah. is. Well, like in the first census, uh, we use library, like, you know, um, there was a lot of work trying to even understand this, like, you know, where is open SSH, right? In the census one project back five, six years ago. And so these are, you know, these are things that are in the amorphous <laughs> ecosystem that it's not always clear you can understand, especially if you you know don't have access to sophisticated tools and infrastructure for doing all the crawling. But other people may have access to the crawling, make some of this data available, and that's useful to the projects. If we have a metric hmm. everyone sort of agrees with. Yeah, I'm I'm inclined to agree too, just just because I know there's there's so many other things that you can kind of gauge popularity to to Vinod's point on. You could look at, also look at stars and forks, and if you could look at downloads or other types of references, but those are super flaky depending on what you're using. Um, and so I feel like if this just focuses on citations and dependencies, then that is that is something can that can be defined across all projects without any sort of the, the asterisk of, we're not really sure, we, th we have this number, but it's not really real. Um, we're not comprehensive enough. So it's just very focused on one aspect that is still useful to know, but not overstating the value of what it's providing. Right. Sounds like we've made your case, Anad. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe in the next meeting, I'll develop a document and put something and bring it here so that we can develop it as a downstream dependency metric. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Um, I had a side question. Uh, knowing that um, I think Matt and Elizabeth were doing the audit, do we know when they're getting to risk and should we make space in our next meeting for whatever they have for us? I think they're moving slowly. <clears throat> and uh, Kevin Lombard and I have taken on working groups um as well so okay. i i don't think they've really gotten started so i would predict that they won't have gotten us our memos by the next time that we meet um, what is the audit yeah question mark question mark question mark above my it's head. uh the, yeah the briefly we're going through all of the metrics that we've curated and we're looking for consistency of structure, style of writing, the ways that information is provided. I think that they're mostly complete, but they've, they've evolved over the course of five years. And I don't think they're completely consistent. And the, the goal of the activity is to identify things that may need to be adapted to change in technology or be made consistent with a standard style. So that our, I think, I mean, I don't think, we, I don't think it's terrible but I, I think we want to do this review at this stage so that it doesn't become terrible. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. Kate, is the depth that so is the depth the depth that so the census report just used the depth dev data that's publicly available here? No, I don't or, think so. Okay. Uh, they basically the census report that just got published was the contributions from Synopsis, uh, SNCC, and uh, we we actually had three, so we could actually get aggregated. And it's just libraries, right? It's the yeah. libraries that the, the commercial vendors were seeing asked to scan and review, and then the tracing of the de dependencies through those for what, what was being scanned from a vulnerability, you know, what was being scanned. So it was the aggregation of three, like the, that first version <coughs> only had two. So that's why we just looked at the top hundred that you guys were helping to basically. Provide. Yeah. And because, but because we had three, we could go neutral enough that we could actually put these full lists in place. Um, and so that's what it was. That's what it was doing. So our synop so synopsis and SNCC are not package managers. There's something else. Well, no, yeah, they're not package synopsis and SNCC. They're um, there's SCA source code analysis tools or uh, okay. software composition analysis tools, depending which version of the acronym you wish to use. Um, and so the software composition analysis, um, they're basically get asked to look at licensing and security issues as part of their commercial offering and. What, the, what it was doing is taking that data aggregation that they would share, um, that the three of them would share neutrally after much, 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 much pulling and pawning. This, this was hard to come up, get out of them, to put it mildly, on a regular, you know, on a consistent basis. So that's what the, that team at Harvard did was basically aggregate and summarize. Okay. And yeah, so getting the data was pulling teeth. Getting the data was pulling teeth, and um, you know, like they wouldn't give it to the LF. They had it had to go to a third, you know, to the Harvard folks. So it's okay, okay. So we, you know, we helped facilitate it all um, with our contacts, trying to help them get them enough data to use. I think the data sets on the website are actually available too. I think they did put the aggregated data set out there. So there's, you know, I think if you actually go to the website. Um, Sophia, I want to pull some data down and have some fun with it. Links to open data. Yes. Oh, this is bad. This is the second data set that I found today that I'd like to explore. Okay. <laughs> put, it in, put it in the notes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like I said, we at least got the data visible. <laughs> what kind of data set is it? Do you know what the format is? No, I, I haven't gone into it. I'm I'm not a good enough data scientist to play too much for there. However, I can connect to you if you if you start exploring and it's not obvious to you, I can connect you to the I think it was Steven at Harvard who was doing the work. Yeah, well I see a bunch of CSVs. Mm -hmm. Um but the explore might be some kind of like bigger table structure. Mm -hmm. All right, sorry, I'll I'll poke around, not in real time with everyone watching. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I'm just so is there is there a place for so so this census report I think is very helpful and like serves uh providing a global view of the most depended on projects Library. from no libraries. Libraries, right. So it's okay, just like right. It's important just library, distinction. And so it's a very important <laughs> distinction because quite frankly, I would consider something like the GNU tool chain to be far more important, but the dependencies are not visible there. There's only the direct dependencies. It's not the fact that you have a dependency on the build tool, for instance. What is, what's the relative utility of dependency analysis tools around the metrics that we've developed that look at like Libyear and um, an enumeration of the dependencies from different package managers are those those metrics obviously don't do this same thing but but they could be applied in the, they could be applied both to understand upstream and downstream dependencies depending on the pool of repos mm -hmm. we were to feed a tool mm -hmm. 
and I'm, I just, I'm, I'm, I honestly don't know the, I, like, I don't have an opinion on the answer, but this is certainly squishy, squidgier than the upstream dependencies. Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm mentally struggling to figure out, okay, what would be the useful metric or metric model or tool or piece of information that we could provide to the open source community that that isn't trying, you know, we don't want to, I mean, it, what the census does is a very specific, distinct report, um, not an ongoing dashboard. It's like a state of the union once every so often. But when I'm like, if I'm running an OSPO and I've got 11,000 projects, I think, I think the upstream dependencies, I think it's upstream, mm -hmm. are, are more critical to understand because that's your risk there. But there is a dimension of risk introduced if, if the downstream dependencies of packages that you have upstream dependencies on are showing fractures that can be measured by, by the, some kind of downstream analysis that's similar to the census. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm babbling and I'm not coherent. I'm trying to like talk through the structure of something that could be useful. Yeah, no, I know I tend to agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think what you had said earlier on reputational risk, if we're, if we're framing it as risk, uh, that as well as Kate's comment around maybe it's more of a PSA encouraging maintainers to be more open about their commitment levels. Mm -hmm. um, where if you're evaluating, if you're going to use a project, is the maintainer community around that project, I think we, we've put, we've, I feel like almost like the, the defect one is a measure of how responsive that community is to address issues in it. But I think even a step before that is whether or not the community has stated any kind of interest to continue the project where, I mean, I think I can say this because it's public, um, but I, in a very specific example, I work at a large company, we've released thousands of projects and yeah. they're in various statuses. There are also some of them are just random hobby things or random code snippets that somebody wrote that wasn't a proprietary differentiator. So we just put it in a GitHub repository, but because it came out of a company, there was definitely an issue around people assuming that all these things were gonna be maintained, like we're maintaining something like TensorFlow. And it's just like, there is a different, there we, we, we knew as a proprietary entity that we had to be more explicit around, these are things that we're actively continuing to build on. This was a random side project that we figured would be better if we just released because someone else could take advantage of it. But that means, this doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna keep maintaining it. So they, we started being more prescriptive about ensuring that projects state that on their page, on their GitHub repository to say, this is currently not being maintained, but we will like address any sort of critical issues or this one's not taking pull requests because there's no active maintainers, but if there's an issue, like basically explicitly defining how you should think about that project in terms of whether or not it's active being maintained or has the potential to be archived and removed um, and just sort of Mostly like we, I think that comes back to reputational risk. We had to do it because there was more of an expectation because it came out of a company that, that it was going to be maintained. Whereas maybe yeah. individuals creating repos there isn't that same level of expectation, but perhaps we should be encouraging more project creators to provide some kind of statement around how they, how they interact with it or how they even care about maintaining it. Or maybe they're just like, Nah, I just made it for fun and I don't care what happens to it. I'm never going to touch it again. And yeah, like, that's I, completely I, fine. It's just like, you should state that. I, I don't know what the world thinks, but my, my longstanding impression of Google is more than any other open source contributor. They're willing to abandon platforms that don't seem to be working. And they're willing to abandon projects that don't seem to be working. And they do it in a very public way. So, like, I know Google can take it away if they decide it's not useful to them. And I, I just accept that as a risk. Like, I forget what the chat thing was 10 years ago. The, that, but, the big one that everyone still is upset about is Google Reader, which is just, it's like, hilarious. It's, like, it's now become a meme. Uh, yeah, there's like... the, <laughs> there, was, there was one that was, like, this combination of chat and discussion board. I can't remember what it was called. 
but it, it, it had a certain level of popularity, but it also the tech quickly, space particularly, yes. Yeah, and it, but it also got really messy really fast. And I think I think it became just this impossible thing to maintain and they let it go. And some people were upset, but we all know that, I mean, everybody knows that Google will let things go if it's not working or if it's not serving the purpose. No, yeah, and, and so I don't think yeah. like Google never loses reputation, at least in my world, when they drop something because I expect it of them when something's not working, and it's not a criticism. It's actually nice, as opposed to the projects that people just stop working on and never say anything. <laughs> the quiet walk away, and uh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're the ones that really irritate me, and I, I <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, like, you know, and there's certain projects that are small, like time. Okay. You're not gonna make too many changes there over time. So but yeah, you know, I'd like to know someone would actually might respond to me. So, so might our next step be, I, I guess I, I said, I said a lot of stuff. I don't know if anyone wrote it down, but just maybe Vinod, when you, take a look at a downstream dependency metric. We've, we've talked about a lot of these different factors and to see if you can propose something that we can chew on and, and actually debate the merits of it so that it's not just a free discussion, but we sort of have a straw dog of here's what, down, here's what a useful downstream dependencies metric would be. And I, th I think you need to consider the availability of data. So for example, yeah. it seems like we do need to be reading package managers to implement it. Yeah. Um, and it also seems that we would need to be, when we want to do this analysis on, on projects, they would have to be package managed, but it would also be good to know what are the upstream dependencies I have and like, I'd be curious what the Z score of those things that I have upstream dependencies on are. And, and not all that might be accomplishable, but yep. I don't know, there's a lot, there's a lot here. This, this feels like when we first started talking about dependencies a little bit, that it, it's, it's a lot of, I don't know, tell me, tell me that I'm wrong or I'm babbling somebody. Well, it's, it's uh, yeah. more like you, you can always widen the net problem like mm -hmm. there are, I, I don't know i guess this has been a common theme for me this week but i i, I went up <laughs> on a deep rabbit hole to try to see if i could articulate project boundaries via github event stream alone um short story is no <laughs> just because of the way that things are named is more characteristic of the community and the individual that released the repository than the project community or the project code base itself. At least that was sort of my like top line thing. But when you're trying to define definitive boundaries around any concept like this with chaining or just unclear structures, it's always gonna be like a the bigger, like, I don't know, just like keeps getting expanded or more complex if we let it. Yeah. Um, so it's worth kind of talking through all those edges because I think in order to count anything we have to define it explicitly or else it's mm -hmm. not accountable ob like a countable thing so right. it's worth having these sort of like hairy long tail ambiguous conversations because there are many arms so we got to lop yeah. them all off and before we know what to lop off we have to state them yeah and, and i think i want to land on the most useful things that are achievable mm -hmm. and and i think we could build metrics that aren't useful and that's the I, that's the piece maybe that I hope we can chew on when Vinod gives us a, an example to look at next week or in two weeks. You know, yep. what, what, what are the, what are the things that would actually be worth, like people could use them in different roles that, and we can see that fairly easily after we have looked at it. Mm -hmm. That, that, that way we're not trying to build all the metrics or one uber metric that doesn't answer any one question well. 42. 
40, 42 is that the answer? Yes, that is the answer to. That's the, the, that's the, the answer. Everywhere, right? But yeah. what's the question? Is huh? <laughs> well, since I read Hitchhikers, maybe I should read it again now. Uh, the only thing you need to know is the, the answer is forty two, and nobody I'm, knows what the question is. <laughs> I love that book. I actually I, read uh, the book after I saw the movie, and the book is way better. Yeah, uh, uh, although the character—I don't know the. The particular actors they chose for the movie. Oh, they're they're thought, great. Did a, it's just did a yeah. fantastic job. They do. Um, it's just the, the, the storyline is a lot cleaner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was it was an amazingly cast film, I would say. Um, it, we are technically out of time now, but I think we've come to some sense of what we're going to do next with downstream yeah. dependencies and working towards a metric that is useful. There are some questions outstanding about whether or not we want to pursue metrics models, but I, I don't see that we need to address that before we think that we're ready. And the last time we talked about it, I didn't think we thought we were ready. No, but I think we're close. I guess yeah. like what the tricky part, and I know we're out of time, so I'll say this quickly, is that we might want to think through a metrics model because it might help us find the gaps where we don't have defined metrics yet before we can publish the model. Because I have a feeling that right. we could out, outline an idea that is comprehensive and succinct, but then we only have like three out of five of the things that we actually want to talk about. So if we start to build a metrics model, it'll help ideally fill, help us fill in the gaps of what we would need to define before we could have a model. We, we absolutely had that experience in the evolution working group where we defined a metrics model and then discovered we needed to develop six metrics <laughs> in order for the model to be realized. So yes, that is a danger. Um, so. And that's how I came up with downstream. Oh, I'm missing something. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, yeah. I, hope, I hope the discussion was valu as valuable for you as it was for me. Um, Kate, did I miss the software engineering meeting on Monday? No, it or... dropped off the calendar and I fixed it today. Okay, so okay. Okay, because I saw the, I saw the calendar written by come through and I'm like, did I miss that? Okay, good. I'm glad I didn't well, miss it. It was, Kate, it was Kate missing up. She didn't delete the old one and put the new one in. So we okay, well, that this morning. I will be there. Great. Talk, <laughs> Thank you. Talk to <laughs> okay. Likewise. Talk to you later, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.